My name is Sandro Mancuso. I was here last year, so it's a pleasure to be back in Swansea for Swansea Conf. So this year I'm going to be talking about complete, something completely different than I spoke last year. Um, so I have a company called Cogerance. Uh, it's a consultancy company. Uh, it's a three-year-old company. We are about 23 people. Uh, and those are some of my details. The reason that I'm saying these things about my company is not because I'm trying to sell you something, although I wanted to, uh, is because it's extremely important for you to understand the context that I'm in. So I'll be talking about uh, organizational changes and things that we've done in our com uh, company. So that's why it's so key that you understand the business I'm in, the size we are, things that we've done that we had uh, in place from the ground up. So we were not retrofitting to an existing culture. So there are loads of things in there that is important for you to take into consideration uh, when I expose that. You cannot just take some of these things that we are doing and apply uh, somewhere else. Um, so back three years ago, uh, I had been a permanent employee for 18 years in many different types of com uh, companies two different continents and stuff, so I worked for many, many different places. And after 18 years as a permanent employee, I believe that I had an idea of what I wanted from a company and what I didn't want from a company, or wanted from a job or not didn't want from a job. And I was in a position where I was creating my own company, which means that I had no excuse. So I knew some of the things that I wanted, and... Uh, of course, there are things that when you do it, so uh, when I put that in, it's like, yeah, everyone wants that, right? So, so yeah, I would like to, a place that I would like to work for and then work with great people and uh, people that are empowered. And I was writing that, or, or the things that I had in my mind when I was thinking, uh, that's what I would like in my new job. It's easier to say those things when you are a permanent employee. Because you shift the responsibility to someone else. You want people to do those stuff for you. So like, I want the company to change so that I feel good inside that company. But myself, like me, myself, like I don't need to do anything. right? I just want the whole world to change, so I'm happy. And uh, yeah, who wants bureaucracy? No one wants that, right? So everything should be transparent. Yeah, of course, if I want transparency. Uh, until you are the person that has all the numbers. Right, so that, that quite is quite, gets quite interesting when it shifts the, your position, when you are sitting on one side of the table, it's very easy to demand things from your company. But then it was the first time that I was sitting on the other side of the table. I said, oh, okay, I would love to have that, but how do I do that? Because there, there is a massive difference between I want to have that and I know how to do that or how to provide that, analyzing a context. So, then I started looking for answers, of course, and some of the things that were at the core, like at least at the, in my heart, like software cross machine, for those of you who know me, like know that this is a very, very like deep in, in my heart. And I love Agile and I love Lean, so all these things, I knew that whatever I would do with the company, of course, when I say I, like I have a business partner that is a fantastic, phenomenal professional uh, called Mashuk Badar, and besides being like a great professional, he's a great friend, and we've been working together for 10 years. So we share a lot of values and things. So every time that I say that's what I was doing, like is always uh, with Mash as well, that is my co-founder and one of my best friends. So we definitely wanted something those principles, or the principles behind these ideologies, methodologies, call it whatever, within the company. All well and good, but how do you do that? So we looked for a few things as well. So I wrote a book myself, so called The Software Craftsman, where I, while still a permanent employee, I kind of put all the things that I wanted, like for my profession, for, for my evolution, and how my, uh, how can I say, utopic view of the world, right? And, and then we looked at other, some, some great books like The Drive from Daniel Pink that talks about autonomy, master, and purpose. There's three things that I love and stuff. So holacracy, many other things. So, and the book that I will be focusing more now is called Reinventing Organizations. I'm going to get back to this list later on towards the end. It's just to give you an idea that although I wanted m many of those things, that didn't mean that I knew how to do them. And actually, build on top of existing knowledge is far easier than actually creating stuff from scratch. 
uh, some of these books, they were actually quite uh, reassuring that some of the things that I had in my mind, there were other people talking about them. And there were other things that I found in some of those books that I had never seen before. And so, wow, that's a great idea. Some of them we purely copied. Other ones we completely adapted according to our context. So in terms of the, the thing that I want to talk about first is... In the reinventing organization, uh, the author, because like one thing is to say, how do we evolve organizational uh, processes? But if you don't understand where you are coming from, it's quite difficult to do that. And he does, uh, he maps different degrees of, or levels of human consciousness and how humanity, humanity evolved and our ego evolved and how that affected society, how society was, uh, reshaped and reorganized, and how companies also follow a similar path. Uh, so I will try to cover some of these things, so it, it will probably give you a better idea of how things evolved and where you are trying to get to now. So, uh, so it goes back a little bit in uh, like uh, 100,000, uh, 50,000 before Christ. So this is where the early days of humanity, still like very disorganized societies, small group of people. So there was no, uh, it's not so interesting because there's not a, a direct correlation to things that we see today in companies. Basically what we're trying to do is to find a correlation between the degrees, of, uh, the levels of consciousness that uh, humanity had in the past and how that led to organized society to how some companies are structured today. So that's why I'm talking about that. So back then there was, uh, the ego was not fully, fully formed and they, they didn't, people didn't perceive themselves as different from each other. So, but we don't think, I don't think that there are any companies that are organized in such a structured way today. Maybe you may not, may know a few, but I don't definitely. So fast forward a little bit, like 15,000 uh, before Christ, uh, there was some, some evolution, like basically like society moved from small families to tribes of a few hundred people. And once you go from a slightly bigger uh, group, a few things change. So there was also an evolution of your ego, of well, our ego. Uh, so basically like uh, we became more self-aware. Um, so, but, so we, we could distinguish ourselves from the, 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 the environment, but we didn't understand back then. And that was, there was a whole research about uh, sociologists and all the people that studied uh, uh, evolution and stuff. So I won't go into the detail, but basically, uh, because we didn't know, didn't understand ca cause and effect, loads of things that were happening, they became magic, right? So, Oh, if the sun is there, it's magic, it's God. So, so there was, that's why they, they, the book like mix a noun and a color to, to identify this period. So the first one was reactive, like we were reacting towards the environment. So the first one was magic, like we were self-aware of ourselves, but everything that we didn't understand was some sort of like magic and, and supernatural or something like that. But at least there was this evolution. So we were now in tribes in hundreds of people and there was some notion of self. Um, that's still not so interesting. Here it gets far more interesting. When it gets like to 8,000 BC, uh, there was an evolution in our ego again because now the, those tribes became like chiefdoms and uh, proto-empires so that the amount of people living together were bigger. So they had a need to organize themselves. Before they were just killing each other and now they had to uh, organize themselves a little bit more. So what happened with our in this environment, we became, our ego be, became fully formed. Uh, and we could completely separate ourselves from each other. But as soon as we did that, we created a distinction. So for example, that's when roughly slavery was introduced. Because now, like, I am myself, she is herself, but I'm different and I don't like her. And then there was this division. So society was reorganizing like that. And that's when there was some organization popping in uh, where there were some very strong uh, figures that would lead that group by fear, right? So, so that's how uh, things were done. And it was also very black and white. The notion of the world is very like, it's either this or that, it's right or wrong and stuff like that. So this kind of behavior, this kind of like level of consciousness is the first one that can start mapping to some existing organizations today. They are, I, 
would rather believe that none of you work in a place like that, but uh, it still can be found in companies in some uh, poor countries where they work with unskilled workers. So there is like a very heavy figure controlling everything by fear and, and stuff. So, so you can see that the, this type of uh, management, if you like, uh, doesn't ex uh, scale very much and is, it's, doesn't allow for good planning and, and the, the, the leader, the boss, still needs to show uh, acts of violence in order to rule. So it needs to say, you need to fear me because that, that's how they, they would uh, rule. So it's still, you still have in there, but it's still impulsive red. They will still kill each other if you, don't, if you disagree with the people leading. And, and of course, that at that time, you, we were already talking about chiefdoms and stuff. So here it gets more interesting. So when we got to 4000 BC, like in Mesopotamia, is when we start having the first, um, sorry, the, the first notion of civilization and states and things like that. Uh, so we start having more organized solution. And there was a very interesting evolution in our own ego and self-awareness where we were completely self-aware, but because the organization was now much bigger, we could not only rule by fear. We needed something as, as a society, something more sustainable, something that you would control, that would live for a bit longer time, so we need more structure in order to keep a reasonably civilized society. At that point, what happened to society was there was a creation of social classes and re organized religion, the caste system, uh, gender differences, and things like that. So, and that led, because there were these groups, so that was the, with the first notion of a proper division of work. I think that uh, at that time, we were talking about, like, the, we have the rulers and administrators, priests, warriors, craftsmen. We have agriculture that was a sign that people were still, for the first time in our uh, history, we were looking into the future because ag agriculture is, is a proof that they were thinking, okay, we need to do something now in order to benefit from that in, uh, in the future. But with this division of, of castes and people, that led to, uh, in our ego, to behave in a us and them situation, right? So if I belong to one caste, I will protect the members of my caste, but I will be against the members of the other caste. So you start having this type of behavior in humanity. And the interesting thing is how that uh, reflects in some of the organizations that we see today. So each evolution, each step uh, in, in consciousness, there was an, an, a breakthrough, a new evolution. So for example, at that point, society wanted a long-term perspective, a stable process. And that's what exactly some of the companies wanted as well. So they say, we need to organize ourselves. It's very chaotic at the moment, so we need to put some structure into it. So following the same footsteps of, of the human evolution, that's when processes started being invented and created, right? So then there was the fungibility of people, because as soon as you create a process where people can replace each other, so people are not so important anymore, uh, and they become a verse of change as well. So, because once the processes are in place, they were coming from a very unstructured and uncivilized, uh, that's why history is important, because they were coming from a chaotic environment, so having the process in place means like we are in a better place today, and that's why we don't want to change. So when you see companies like being resistant to change, it's like, where were they coming from? Did they start like that, or they were in a very unstructured way, and now they have a process, and now it makes it safer for them, and that's why they don't want to evolve. Um, so then there was like another thing that they wanted to achieve was like size and st stability, and for that they needed to. So society also created, like we saw with the rulers and craftsmen and workers and stuff, like the military companies created the same pyramids. Right, with people at the top, workers at the bottom, and all the degrees uh, in between. So that model that we adopted as a society as we evolved was also adopted within companies as they evolved. Um, so 
And the same way that happens with, with, with humanity, where we started, like, there was a discrimination, or like, if I belong to this caste, I don't talk to the other one, the whole us and them in, in society, that happened exactly within the organizations that are the, the developers, the, the, the business, the, the, the whoever else. And so, so they are in the silos, not only like the different uh, skill sets, but also the different departments. And then, of course, as we have people that are seen as inferior, because they are in a lower uh, position in their pyramid, there is the whole us and them, and then there is this perception that, oh, if you are a worker, you are lazy because you are, don't belong to this caste, so I need to control you. So there is all this uh, stuff going on. Um, so they start, when you have the, py the pyramid, normally you start from a position of mistrust. Right? So you don't trust people, so you micromanage them. You, you, you impose your will on them. So you will never start from a position of trust. Um, so they still need to, uh, and that's, that's what leads you to a, com a very command and control um, approach. The reason that we, we, we uh, you mentioned the conformist umber, because like the, the, the first word was impulsive, you were reacting. Uh, the conformist means that we have a structure and according to where you were born or which position you, you play within the company, you conform to that position. You behave in a way that is expected from you in that position. And what was very interesting to see is the social mask uh, that is adopted in this kind of environments because although we are self-aware in terms of our ego, we end up behaving in the way that is expected from us, right? So if, I, if I'm among the developers, I'm expected to work in a certain way. But as soon as I move on to the architecture team or whatever, I'm expected to behave in a different way. So we are looking for acceptance, right, from other groups. That's how our ego evolved. And, and once you move from one group to the other, you try to behave in a way to be accepted again because we are uh, people that we, we live in groups, right? So, so we want to behave in a way that we are accepted and sometimes that makes that the older group reject us or we pretend that we don't belong there anymore, right? So you have that as well. So that was the conformist number. And I, I definitely, unfortunately, still see today uh, this kind of behavior when you talk about silos and stuff like that, blaming culture, that is the, site, the, the comparison that you can make with the degree of consciousness that we had uh, 4,000 years ago. Uh, so things got very, very interesting in the Renaissance, right? So that is like from 1300 until almost modern days. So there was a completely shift uh, in, uh, in society. So we, we, were, we came from a very bureaucratic, very structured following rules to a group of people from the Renaissance until now focused on sci uh, science and criticizing everything, questioning religion, questioning everything. We, I want to know how it happens. So that's, how, that's what we've done, right? Science evolved enormously in the last 600 years. And so that brought a completely different, new, uh, different degree of uh, consciousness as well. So we, we start focusing on research and stuff. Uh, the worldview changed as well. So we as a society, we start saying like achievement and success is the goal, right? So people start changing their behavior to say, my goal in life is to have more money is to achieve, is to be successful, is to be seen as successful, right? And that behavior, that degree of consciousness, that actually also went into some of the organizations. So we see some uh, very multinational uh, companies, now they, they were structured, so they needed innovation. So the same way that we as society went for science and tried to discover new things, so the company said we need to be more successful, uh, have a bigger market share or dominate the market and stuff. So they started, although they have a very rigid uh, structure, they start having pockets of excellence. So you can see in very large organizations that there are pockets of excellence where they allow some very, uh, how can I say, motivated or, or specialized people to create new things, but they are still a small pocket on those organizations. So, but there was, for the first time, we start seeing some investment in innovation and stuff. And then, of course, there was accountability as well, because as soon as you start uh, giving people more uh, power, like with these pockets of excellence, we want to know who is accountable. And so top, middle, uh, top uh, management and middle management start defining goals 
and targets and things like that. So, and in order to guarantee or to try to guarantee that people would follow, uh, try to achieve those targets, they provided the carrot, right? So before, in the previous one, we, we had the stick. If you don't conform, you have the stick. This one, we want you to innovate, and by the way, that's your carrot if you achieve something. And that's when you start having the performance appraisals and bonus schemes and quality awards and all this kind of stuff. So always like, if you achieve more, I'll give you more, right? So, and then there was like, they were still a bit worried about uh, give con control, uh, but, but they were trying to con uh, control, when, whenever they gave control, they wanted to control. And then there was the whole mer mer meritocracy as well. So that's, again, the, the carrot, right? So everyone, the whole, these, oh, everyone can achieve everything, and if you work hard, you can have a big office, you have their bonus and stuff. So that was the whole culture, right? So if you do more, you get more. So definitely see that in many, many places. And this is what I think at least the most IT companies, uh, and including ourselves, like in quite a few aspects are, and even as humanity. So there was a, a small transformation in, in our eagle as well. We finally, like we see many conferences and many people talk about empathy and trying to understand other people and have inclusions uh, and stuff. So we are looking for f uh, fairness and minority groups, and we are trying to make society more just, right? So that's basically how we are evolving many in the past uh, six, uh, six decades or something. So mainly after the war, there was also a big push for that. So that reflected in, in organizations as well. So mainly the agile movement, you can see a lot of uh, empowerment, so a lot of methodologies and things. Oh, that's empower. We need to empower people. And, and, and we had the terms of uh, managers and servant leaders and all this kind of good stuff. So all very, very good stuff. Uh, it's still like value driven. We need to provide value. Uh, also very, very interesting. So we start seeing companies that became far more modern. They flatten their structures, the, their hierarchies. They start trusting the people in the front line to make decisions, right? So, so that was very, very interesting. Uh, and we also had companies with slightly more, uh, with multiple stakeholders, but stakeholders outside the companies. For example, companies becoming more aware of the environment, of injustice and slavery, uh, so, so work done by, by kids and stuff like that. So, so we evolved and companies also evolved. Uh, family was the, 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 the main uh, metaphor for companies like that. I, I like to believe at least that many companies and many people are operating at those levels. So these levels of consciousness is not that you move from one to another. Imagine like a Russian doll. So basically as you evolve as a human being or as a company, you, 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 you gain more skills or more control or more awareness, that would be the right term, but you can still operate at a different levels. If I feel threatened, I may op operate at a red level, right? I can be become very violent, but I can operate on a very different level in a different context. So you cannot just say like this company is, is green or this person is red or so on and so forth. Like we operate at different levels at different contexts. So, and finally, the interesting thing about moving to teal is what happens to our ego. Because even with the whole empathy, when you talk about empathy and everything else, it's lovely, we feel good. We feel that we are good, a decent human being. Right? I respect her because she's a woman. I respect someone else because it has a different color. Or I feel good about myself. Right? I need to, to support inclusion, but I still own the truth. Right? So I still see the world as my vision of the world is the true vision of the world, and I do my best to accept the rest. So that's normally where some people operate, and I'm definitely including myself on that which is quite revealing to, to kind of study and understand all of that. So when it got to Teal, there was like a, a thing that blew my mind in a way. Uh, there is a, the next level of consciousness is the whole disidentification of the ego. You completely detach yourself from your ego and you start seeing the world in a more objective way. So there's no blame anymore because you, you are not trying to satisfy yourself. So you don't blame anyone. So you don't try to satisfy your fears and, and anything so you can be more objective when you talk about it. And that's the next degree of consciousness, which means that it's almost like a separate, uh, it's, it's kind of like where the green ends at one step of evolution and the two starts a new one. So with, with this disassociation of the ego, you kind of end up decreasing the need to control people 
And we start from a position of trust first, because you don't need you to satisfy your own fears, which is quite interesting. It's easier, e e much easier said than done, like if you are leading a company. And the worldview changes as well. You start trusting your inner rightness uh, as a compass. So am I doing that? Is it me? Right, so, so if I make, need to make the decision, does it conform to how I, see, is it a fair thing? Would I be violating my own principles? So that's, that's what it means. So I won't have time because I could talk about that forever, right? So as, as you can see, but like uh, up until here, I've been uh, showing the, the, the evolution of levels or degrees of consciousness and how that was mapped to your organization. In the, so in the Reinvention Organizations book, every time that there is a new evolution, there are a few breakthroughs when it comes to companies. The book covers a lot of companies in there. Right? There are, I think, the 20 examples. Most of, I think all of them are above 100 people. Some of them have thousands of employees. And different companies did very different things to address some of the breakthroughs that are in the bucket of the teal, that is like self-management, wholeness, and evolutionary process. And that's, again, you need to understand the context that, that I'm in. Right? So we have a three-year-old company that is 23 people. We are hiring more people, but we are still small. We are going to end the year with less than 30 or around 30, still quite small. Many of the things that we tried to address these things, we did from ground up. We were not fighting an existing uh, culture. Right, so this is very, very important. So I'm going to say what we are doing, because those are the values, right? What other companies will do to implement the values are the tools. So the tools will vary from company to company. So the first thing that I had to, when I had the opportunity to, to build my own company, I said, like, first of all, don't be a bloody hypocrite, right? Because like, now I cannot blame anyone. I cannot say my manager is a... Dickhead, right? Sorry, it's filming. Right? So, yeah, beep. So, the, so, I could not blame anyone, right? So, so, I wrote a full book on it. It's like, do I have these principles? So, here are a few things that we are doing, right, within that context. So, self management. Of course, first of all, it's flat structure, right? So, no one uh, is boss of anyone. We are peers. We don't, I don't have a fixed desk in my own company, right? So, a very important thing is not about flattening the structures. It's about identifying what is a core function and what is a support function. So we are a software company, which means that HR, accounting, sales, they are all support functions. What brings money to our companies is developing software for clients. That's our core business. Everything else is support. What happens in certain companies is that the support, com the support roles, because they are constantly in the office, while other people are doing the work and, and bringing money to the company, they need to justify why they are there. The support funds, they need to justify, oh, we have a HR department, so I need to justify, I need to do something. I need to, so every three months, I need to come up with a new policy, a new rule or whatever. So we kept that to a minimum. So they don't, we will never influence. They are there to support us, period. Right? They don't create anything if you don't want them to create. So out of 23 people, we have one person paying support role. It sounds great, but it means that when you don't have support role, the people playing the core role or the core function, uh, function all these things, hiring, accounting, and laws and stuff, you need to do yourself because you have no one to do. So then you have an option. Do I want to start getting involved with the business of the company and know how every single aspect of the business works? Or do we want the support functions to be part of our company and start dictating how we work? So it's not a free lunch. So most of us now, like there was a talk before of uh, b uh, developers getting closer to the business. That's it. If you don't have support functions, developers, they are forced to get involved with every single aspect of the business. So that's business involvement, which means even sales and everything else. So shared responsibilities. So this is quite tricky, even in terms of sales, right? So, so some of the developers say, like, oh, I would like to have a better project. I want to work with this Scala. Or, so, well, why are you telling me that? Do something about it, right? So if you don't want someone to make decisions for you, you need to make decisions yourself. 
right? Otherwise, you're going to be controlled. But then someone, well, but how can I sell? Like, I, I don't have contacts. Yeah, sure, then you play to your strength. I have more contacts, which means that when I need to do sales, I will do more contacts. Some people don't have them, but how can they do that? Oh, I love Scala, I love whatever, mobile development. Write a blog post, go to a conference, show to other people, go to the community, show to other people that we have this capability and we are quite good at it. So that's how you can help our business to survive and also to get the projects that you want because you are showing that. You are creating an environment where those type of things that you want to have or want to do may happen. Right? So I wanted people to take responsibility in the business, to contribute. I have like a, 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 a very clear thing in my mind is that I am limited by my own ignorance. Right? There's no escape of that. I will always be limited by my own ignorance. And the only way that I can go beyond of what I know is if I can harness like, people's minds as well. So like, can we bring more people to contribute to that? What I found ex extremely challenging is I went back in my career and said, like, why did we have so many discussions with business and we struggled so much to reach an agreement? Before, I had only one vision. That is the view of the, the developer. As I played a little uh, higher positions in different companies and, and where I am now, I end up having different perspectives of the same problem. And what I realized is that it's much harder to achieve consensus when people don't have the same amount of information. So if people have different pieces of the information, the chances for them to reach an agreement is very low. But if everyone had access to every single piece of information, we can increase the chances of reaching an agreement. So that's why open financials and open salaries come in. We didn't do that because we find it's cool. We didn't do that because we want to say, oh, look, our financials and salaries are open. Look how cool they are. No, there is a reason for that. Because while they are hidden, you have an elephant in the room. While they are hidden, I cannot have a sensible debate with my own colleagues and say, should we invest on that? Should we stop working with this client? Should we open an office somewhere else? Or should we go for a training course? Should we pay whatever? Should we invest in apprentices? Because no one has the whole information. But if everyone had, hopefully it would be a little bit better. But that means that everyone knows how much I get from the company. I need to start to justify my own behavior. When you open everything, it's easier to say, oh, let's open everything. But you yourself that are in control, you are hidden behind a wall. Everyone else is playing the rules that you created, but you don't. No, I had to include myself. I need to justify my own salary. Right? So that becomes very interesting. So opening financials is actually quite easy. And some people, like, they open, but they don't. Like, they have, like, for example, some people say, oh, we have open financials. What you, so how do you do that? Ah, oh, we, every, uh, I don't know, every quarter, the CTO coming up from the clouds and stuff, say, look, I'm going to show you a spreadsheet with our projections, and uh, that's how our sales pipeline is looking. Like. That's not open financials, right? Open financials is how much I have on the bank right now. That's open financials. So we built a, 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 a small dashboard that connects to our accounting system and projects everything in there. We have the cash flow. We have how much we have on the bank, how much you need to pay VAT, and everything else. Everything is there. How much each client is bringing to the company, everything. Everything. So, um, decision making. Empowering is a great thing. Everyone says, of course, we wouldn't disagree with empowerment. But even with the best will, like being empowered doesn't mean that I know what to do. I may want to help, I just don't know what to do. So, we had to do a few things uh, to help people to understand. What do I know about running a company? I've been doing that for three years. I know fuck all about that. So it means that I'm learning as I go along. The problem that I have, that I will have tomorrow, it will be the first time that I'm dealing with that. So, and that is the same if I ask our own people and say, look, you need to get involved with our business decision. I said, well, yeah, it would be awesome, but I, where do I start? So we had to put some things in places. So for, first of all, opening everything. And, and so we decentralized decision making. This was a very interesting thing. This is going through an evolution. We didn't start some of these processes we did like from the very early days. Some of them are, they went through an evolution. Some of them are recently. So initiative circles is 
probably one of the, the ones is an evolution of something that we had. Before we had what we call a, a, a crossman board, we had uh, a democratic election in our company where people would vote on three people that would form part of a board. And that board would be composed by myself, my business partner, and three other people elected by the company. So why did we go for this approach? First, truth, because I was scared of giving control. That's why. Why didn't I just say, oh, you know what, make whatever decision you want? Because I was scared to death to do that. Right? So people, if things are going badly, they find a new job next day. They are always killed. I will have a, a problem with the government or with another company or a legal problem. Right? My family will have a problem. So of course I was scared of that. So we had to have a transition that to make my fear be a little bit like to control my, my fear in a way. So, so we had the board. So the way that it started was people, if they wanted to change something in the company, they would come up with a proposal. They would submit the proposal to the board. The board would analyze the proposal and would work with this person. It's not like a yes or no, approve, disapprove, or approve or reject. It's basically like, OK, this person is proposing that. What is the real need that this person has? Is this a good idea? Yes, approve. Otherwise, no, this is too risky. So what is the real need? Can we work to this person, figure out if he can satisfy that need in a different way? Or polish that? So that was the initial thing. It, it turned out that the board was quite useless. We were not actually meeting to, to, to do many things or to discuss things. There was not many proposals anyway. So we moved to, and, and people start working in a different way, understanding how we do business. So we, we moved to an initiative circle. Initiative circle is a technique that we are using currently that we adapted uh, from one of those books. Uh, it's voluntary. So we need at least a quarter of three. So any person in the company can change whatever they want. So for example, a concrete example, some people want uh, uh, health insurance. Remember, we don't have support roles. That's one, that's, that's no free lunch. You want the health insurance? I'm not doing that. You want health insurance? Give us some quotes. So they need to figure out. So you need a quarter of three, at least, for the idea to move forward. Why is that? Because with all the good intentions, not always you have great ideas. So having to convince at least two other people is already a way to validate or to polish an idea. Right? If you cannot convince a single person, you may reveal your, uh, what you are proposing. So once you have like three people, there are exceptions to that, by the way. Uh, if you want, I can talk about the details later. But, like, but that's normal how it works. So, and then any, so the, the rule is no one can be rejected. The initiative circuit is controlled on trail. As soon as you create a new initiative, updates are, uh, uh, pops up in our Slack channel, so we are always aware of what's going on. Uh, every time they change something, we know in, on Slack every, everything. So anyone can join, and no one can be rejected. And some people, what we found was, at the beginning, the early days, we tried to achieve consensus in everything. We said, like, we want to change this in our organization, so let's have a general meeting with everyone and try to get consensus. Analysis paralysis. There's no way, because people are being forced to give opinions on things that they may not care too much. Right? So the initiative series is far better, because some people care far more about certain things than others. So this way allows people, only the people that care about certain things, to focus on them. And then you have the role of an advisor. So for example, if you feel that you can contribute, you can join the group as an advisor, which means that you don't have decision-making power because you're not part of the, but you can advise. But if you want to, to, to have a decision-making, you join the initiative. So that's, and, and there is one other rule. The group, whatever they are proposing, they need to seek for advice and they also need to talk to everyone that's gonna be impacted by the decision being made by that initiative. So, so that's roughly how it works. And whatever the group decides, it's going to be done. So if I care, if it's something that I need to sign a check, I will judge how much it represents for the whole company. Are we talking about a small amount that is to make a difference for a lot of people? Or are you talking about a huge and significant amount of opening an office in a different country? That would decide, like, I will decide what I'm going to join or what I'm not going to join or just advise according to how I will be impacted by that. So there is another rule in what we've done, because as I said, we tried to achieve consensus in everything that we did, and that was a big mistake, right? 
designing by consensus and stuff, it just doesn't work, right? So get the people that care about that, then you discuss, but not force people to give opinions about something that they, they don't care or they don't know what, yeah, they just don't want to be there. So, but we have a role. We need to move fast. So remember that software craftsmanship, lean and agile was still at the core of what we did, and that means how we run the company. It's far more important to make a decision than not to make a decision. Like, I would rather make the wrong decision than not make a decision at all, as long as we can inspect and adapt. So for example, even myself and my business partner, we, we've been friends for 10 years, we worked together for 10 years. I'm 1 billion percent that we share exactly the same values. But that doesn't mean that we agree in every single implementation of what we want to do. And that is the same with our people as well. So some people will feel more passionate about some things than others. So you say, you know what? All right, we, we had a debate for five, 10 minutes, whatever, whatever amount of time. Do, 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 the, do your way. And as soon as you know more, we will discuss, which means that no decision is, made, is, is written in stone. And everyone is conscious. No one can use the argument, oh, but yesterday you said that it was yes. No, yes, it was yesterday. Today is a different day. Right? So if we, are, if we can survive this kind of environment, we can always move forward right? and always polish our own ideas. And that's what we did with our decision making. My business partner has a pet peeve with meetings, right? So, so a thing that we introduced at UBS even, like uh, he did actually, we don't meet to talk about shit. Either we meet to decide something or we don't meet at all. So for example, if someone is proposing something, we are not going to meet to figure out ideas. You say like, what are you trying to resolve? People can form small groups or work in isolation, come up with a proposal, send that to by email or in whatever format, and then once we have information, then we schedule a meeting to make a decision on that thing in there. But you don't need to have these pointless meetings and very long meetings where we are trying to figure out an idea. No, you can do that in isolation. I don't need to be there or you don't need to be there while I'm trying to figure out, organize my own thoughts. So that's how, so we don't have formal meetings. Either we meet to decide or we don't meet at all. Uh, it's luck. I know that it sounds odd to promote a tool, but it's luck is at the heart of what we do. The communication, like we have people working different projects across different clients and stuff. Our luck doesn't stop, even weekends and people are reading stuff and it doesn't stop. So People are helping each other in different projects. So during the day, so people have in oh, I'm trying to set up this continuous integration thing. People in a different project, oh, you can use this tool and blah, blah. It's, it's like, it's at the heart of everything that we do. And we have many different types of channels and stuff. Um, open salaries, like it was, because I don't have much time, so I'm gonna need to run through a little bit. So it was a big hoo-ha, right? So, so, oh my God. And so I told everyone, like, of course, in agreement with my business partner, I said like, this is the last decision that I'm going to make on my own. There's no debate. There's no democracy. I'm going to open the salaries, period. There's no discussion. So we took a long time to do that because we were scared. We had to readjust people. It's, it's funny, like even in, in, in a small period of time, how many discrepancies you end up having because each person negotiates in a different way. And then once you hire that person, you move on. And then you hire a different person in a different stage of your company or what you move on. You very rarely go back and compare them. And that's when you start seeing these. So even in a small company, we had discrepancies. We had to readjust and rebalance everything, and then it was open. And, and even running the risk that some people could maybe leave the company, I would still go ahead. Because this is the type of decision that is a no turning back decision. You cannot come back from a decision like that. Once you open financials and salaries, if you take that away, you're going to destroy the culture of your company. Because that's the ultimate show of trust. Right? There's nothing hidden anymore. If they know how much I earn, what else would I hide? If they know the, the, exactly the situation that we have in our bank account. So if I take that back, everyone's like, why the fuck is he doing that? What's happening in this company? Right? You cannot come back. So that's why that was a no. But since then, then we, we try to, to do things uh, together and stuff. Salary reviews is going through a different process. Like I won't have, like this is a long, I have changed seconds. So we are evolving this process, uh, but we don't have formulas just to set the expectations. We don't have formulas, we don't have some crazy calculations. No, it's very individual. 
people know how much they earn, and then they can say, look, I've been doing this kind of work, what do you think about that, and blah, blah. And, and people can also like say, look, I've been working with this person, as it happened before, this person's doing a great job, and blah, blah, I think that she deserves a little bit more and stuff. So, so basically, it's quite organic for now, because we're quite small. So recruitment is always a challenge. So people, because there, there is always this question, okay, now we have recruitment and open salaries. How do I justify a new person that I bring in in a different salary? Why would I need to do that myself? If I'm doing all the recruitment, of course I need to decide, when, uh, I need to justify my own decision. But if I ask the company to recruit, so if I say like, you are a development team, we need to interview this person here. There is a group of people that you go through that interview process and the group of people that uh, were part of that recruitment process, they make the offer. Which means that I don't need to do that myself. Which is awesome. So if they disagree, they disagree with their own colleagues. Or with themselves, right? So that's awesome. So it puts some constraints as well. Which means that we sometimes you cannot pay more for people that maybe we would like to have, but it wouldn't fit. So there are challenges in there, right? So uh, I'll move like a little bit. Like there are a lot of things that we do, like in wholeness, like to keep the thing, the people together. The forces that pu pull us apart. We are a consultancy company. The forces that pull us apart are quite strong. So we need to make a lot of effort because we're working out with clients that don't share, not always share exactly our values. So we need to put a lot of effort in to keep the unity and the culture. So we have a lot of social events and stuff like that. So our office, there's always people after working hours that just pop in for a beer, basically. And we had even like uh, barbecues in my house because I made, for me it was extremely important that people bring their own families, their own kids to meet my wife and my kids in my place. So we know each other at the personal level. It makes uh, solving uh, professional issues in a much better because we can relate to maybe a, a, a personal problem that that person may have, right? So it's much easier to, to address certain things. And um, I think that in this area here is, I think that the most different one is we don't have vision or mission statements. I think there are a bunch of bollocks, right? a bunch of empty words in a wall. And there's no way that you can say, like, this is the mission and the vision of my company. The mission and the vision of your company will be created by the people that work there. Right? The way that they behave, the way that they want to do things, they want, that they want to push things forward. And also, you are constraining your company to a certain direction. We are forced into, according to the, the, the uh, business uh, area that we are in, we can be very flexible with the direction that we are, that, that we go. So, we, it's calling like sensing the organization, that is normally the term. So if people want to come up with a new training course or they want to invest on something different, we can decide as a company if you want to do that. If you want to invest in a product, we decide as a company. So we don't need to limit ourselves to a specific area or, or direction. So we don't need to have a mission. The mission will evolve as we, like we say, the teams are immutable. As you add more people to your team or people leave your team, it's a different team. Right? So the only thing that we share is like, what do we need to do to be here? So what we discuss is, what do you want to do? Um, I think that is in, uh, sorry, targets. Uh, it's not even there. It's in science and organizations, I assume. So I don't know my own mind map. Uh, so what do we need to do to be here next month or next year? For me, this is the core. Like, so we love working together. We are creating a team of like-minded people that share a lot of values. So what do we need to do to be here next year or to create an environment that we love? And this is our mission. This is our goal, right? Everything else can change. So, and so here are the, let me just make it a little bit easier. So those are the books that I mentioned. Uh, I, I strongly recommend the first one. People say that it's awesome, by the way. So, uh, but those books uh, are, are quite uh, insightful. Uh, and that's my contact as well at Kujun, so thank you very much. <laughs>